Welcome to Fresh Catholic, a podcast for those who are converting, reverting, or simply want a fresh perspective of the Catholic faith to help them to open their hearts and minds to become closer to the love and goodness of Christ. My daily prayer is that I will be a bright light to others, to be filled with the love and light of Christ, so that when people look at me, they see Him radiating out from me for His glory. Hello and welcome. I'm Lori Balderas, and I'm so happy you're here. So I have a very special guest sitting with me today. I'm very excited. I have been trying to get Jack Cooper in this chair across from me for a while now. I had his brother Henry on an episode, episode number 41. If you haven't listened to that one, go back and have a listen. And so I have Jack Cooper here. Hello, Jack Cooper. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I feel so honored to have you here. I It's been a little tricky getting you here. You are one busy man. And I said this in the episode with Henry. I didn't realize you guys were brothers. So I think that's really funny. I just thought, wow, these two guys are just amazing. And how were you raised to turn out to be these faithful boys that you are? Like, what was the secret sauce that your mother and father had? I chuckle at that because uh, just, just a couple weeks ago, I actually had... Um... The similar question. And and I really couldn't think of you know, a specific thing, per se. And I've had this conversation with my mother and my brother a number of times. Uh, basically, like, what went you know, right? What series of events, what decisions were made that really kind of produced, quote-unquote, my brother and I? And to some degree, I almost can't think of anything. Um, there really isn't any, like, catechesis or, like, strong catechetical environment that my parents really created that really makes me think this was something or there really wasn't like a strong encouragement to pray every day. And so it makes me think that there's, it really isn't a formula per se. That being said, I can, with hindsight, say maybe these are just some things that could have been done better. Right. And but my mom's input on that is, well, I was praying when you guys were growing up. I was like praying that you guys would grow up well, that you guys would, you know, well, for every single day she says she prays. And she didn't really pray around us. That really wasn't something that we really saw. My brother and I really didn't see my mom pray. And like the, my brother mentioned in, in the uh, podcast that you did with him, my dad's not Catholic, right? But he used to come to um, church with us sometimes. So uh, even leading up to COVID, maybe it wasn't every week, but pretty consistently he would go with us to mass. And he would maybe not dress the nicest or, you know, really uh, do all the things that you're supposed to do at, at mass. But the fact that he was there was just really awesome for us. And... So, so yeah, I'd, I'd say that there's there was a lot of a, a, a lack. I wouldn't say a lot of, but a lack of really strong like catechesis and and prayer like ex, uh, example. But also just like keeping in mind that there are at least four saints that I can name. Two of them had really strong um, examples from their family of really holy people. So Saint Teresa of Lisieux. Um, there was another one that I was thinking, and then there's also a couple of other saints that don't have that example. So our St. Saint, Saint Augustine was the other one. St. Augustine had a very strong example of his mother. But you also have um, St. Teresa of Avila and St. Francis of Assisi, whose parents were not really that taking the faith that seriously, maybe as seriously as they could have. But they still turned out to be very faithful. In fact, they're obviously saints in the Catholic Church. And so I think it's maybe almost a, a fallacy or maybe an error sometimes to say that it has to be because of what your parents are doing, right? Your parents can definitely have a strong, like, um, uh, factor or role in that, but they're not all of it. And so I think I think part of it is just recognizing that's a really long way of saying I think it's just God. I think it's just like, look, you know, I'm going to give these two, you know, young gentlemen a lot of grace to do whatever I need them to do. Because I look at my my friends and not my family, but some of my family as well, and they're not they're not as faithful. It's like, well, what's what's the difference? What's the difference? And it's not really, I don't think it's in the way we've been raised. I think it's just something that God is, a grace that God has just given us. I, I kind of believe in that too, because of the fact of, I've talked about how I became a Christian a long, long time ago, and that was fine, but it was when I was drawn to the Catholic Church. That wasn't anybody's doing except God's doing. And God's the one that laid out that path for me. And that's when it happened. And I'm talking to more and more people that will be coming on as guests in the new year. And one of the ladies I just interviewed doing a pre-interview, it was the same thing. God just spoke to her, literally spoke to her. She heard his voice. And I love those stories because 
she wasn't raised in any such of a way. But I just think that's beautiful and miraculous. And it's again, it's like if you kind of are open to it. So that kind of being said, then, is there any special like gifts is what I call them? What gifts did your parents give you that you see you personally have that you got from your parents? It doesn't have to be necessarily faithful or Catholic. I'm just wondering like what you think you get from your parents. So I've been able to notice in the past two-ish years, just a lot of the things that as naturally just I I do uh, that my dad does. So certain mannerisms, uh, certain just behaviors. So I really focus on like cleaning my room today. And I realize that that's the exact same thing my dad does when it's like that downtime, like over the weekend, he will basically clean the house. And it's like, dad, like you can take a deep breath. It's the weekend. You're supposed to relax. But here I am doing the exact same thing. It's like, well, I, I have free time. You know, I can finally clean my room. Um, and I would say that there's, there's part of that. It's also my, my mom is, a, is an engineer. And so I'd say that I have a little bit of her intelligence and some of the ways that she tries to understand the world. I would say I follow along with that. And also some of her um, assertiveness. Right, so there's certain situations where it's like I've had to take the leadership role and I very easily slip into that and step into that. But there's also sometimes where I'm very indecisive. So I'd say that's more so along my, my dad, who a lot of the time will kind of just let my mom make decisions. Personality-wise, I would say it's probably the couple gifts that I get from each of my parents. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love to see what people get from their parents because, you know, we're all a mix. What did you want to be when you grew up, when you were a little boy? So I remember when I was in like third or fourth grade, I think that question kind of came up and I, I thought about it for like maybe five minutes. And over the, the course of the next couple of months, I thought about it a little bit more, but it was astronaut, firefighter, police officer, or maybe, maybe join the army. But each of those was kind of like a shot in the dark. You know, I felt like I had had a bow and arrow and I kind of just shot it and kind of wherever it landed, I was like, well, I guess that's where I landed. Really wasn't anything that I felt really convicted by. And maybe if you ask my parents when I was like you know, in kindergarten, maybe I said something different. I just don't remember that. But I feel like if you had asked any you know, average child roughly in third grade these days, your average kid would probably say, oh, I want to be this or I want to be that. I want to be president. And they're going to be like really convicted by that. They're going to say, this is what I want to do. Now, obviously, they don't understand what, all that goes into that. And that's going to change. But at the same time, that like they probably really are convicted by that in that moment. And I don't think I had that. I don't think I was really ever convicted by you know, being an astronaut, or being a firefighter at that time. Uh, but that might also just be like, hindsight and I might just be projecting my current situation onto my past self. So I I don't really know uh, exactly, but I would say those four were the ones that came to mind. Well, it's interesting because those four things in my mind are service related and also dangerous. So that's kind of interesting, but that's kind of a typical boy thing, right? Yeah, I think that's like, I think you're right. Like a third grade boy, that that seems right about what they would say. (laughs) Yes, yes, it does. In my mind, those are hero jobs. And I get it. It's like I know people where they get their mindset on something like Simon Balderas. He was an artist as a child. I mean, he, he's turned into an artist. So I think some people, I have a friend who's was into fashion and she's a fashion designer. And she's always been like that most most fashionable five-year-old I ever knew, you know. And to this day, she's the most fashionable person I know. But I do think, you know, sometimes your ideas change about what you think you want to do and you get older and it kind of shifts. So I want to know what drew you to the seminary, the priesthood. Was there an event or a moment that something kind of clicked for you and you thought, oh, this is what I want to pursue? We'll be right back. Rising anti-Semitism. New generations redefining how they connect with Jewish traditions. Changing dynamics among Jews around the globe. Take a deep dive into these topics and more on Mosaic, Exploring Jewish Issues, the podcast brought to you by the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County. Hear from the thought leaders, politicians, scholars, and artists at the forefront of Jewish life today. Subscribe to Mosaic, Exploring Jewish Issues, wherever you listen to podcasts. So bouncing off that last question about uh, what I want to be when I grow older, because I didn't really have that strong conviction, especially going to high school, I think that was really strong, like really, really fertile ground for a calling to the priesthood because I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I was a junior in high school. It seems like most of my associates and my classmates, my friends 
have what they want to do figured out. They want to be lawyers. They want to be, you know, coders. They want to be, you know, this thing or that thing. And I didn't really have that strong conviction. I didn't know what college I wanted to go to. I didn't know what I wanted to study. I didn't know what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. But because of that, um, it was probably about a couple months after I kind of realized that I didn't know what I wanted to do because all my classmates were talking about colleges and whatnot, that it was about six months later that I had this prayer experience. I saw one of the priests at during a penance service during Lent, and all he did is pick up a chair, just move it to five feet, and then put it down so that he could hear someone's confession. Very simple act. But in that moment, I was reminded of a priest that I knew when I was in like third, fourth, fifth grade. And his, his holiness, the, the warmth that everyone just felt around him. The church was packed. You probably know who I'm talking about, Father mm-hmm. Steve Davern. The church mm-hmm. was packed every single Sunday. I have very rarely, if ever, seen that church packed like that since. Mm-hmm. And just being reminded of that, like, okay, maybe, maybe I could do that. Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe that's something that I could try and live up to. Not that I have the capacity or the power already, but that maybe that's something that, that could capture my heart or something I could aspire to later in life. And that was the first moment, the first start where I started thinking about the priesthood. And even now, it's sometimes hard to articulate exactly why that calls to me. But it just, like you, like you mentioned, like the, the, the sacrifice, but also the service, I would say that that's probably a good articulation. That'd be the first time that I was junior in high school that I was really like open mm-hmm. to it. And obviously there's been things since, things have changed a little bit, but... But yeah, it's... And you're how old now? 21. 21, yes. I, I have to remind myself I'm 21 and not 22 because my birthday's coming up in a couple of months and I keep mm-hmm. trying to say I'm 22. I'm like, nope, I'm still I'm still 21. I'm still 21. <laughs> huh. So. Okay, well, that uh, that makes sense to me. I can see that definitely role models, definitely like getting that in your head. Like, again, kind of shifting service. Being a priest isn't an easy job. It also could be dangerous. So it's, I'm not like discounting that it's different than those other vocations, but it's interesting that it's like a different way of serving. And I just think it's so needed and so necessary. It's so life-giving and important. And I just know that our priests, they work so hard. They have such long hours. And one of the things I appreciate about Father Matthew in particular is when he gets up and he is pretty honest about like how he's feeling about some things, he doesn't go up there and just act like everything's fine and dandy all the time and no worries, no problem. It's like he'll say, you know, like it's really hard. It's very emotional, all these things. I think that's really, I love to hear his honesty about it. So here's a deeper question. When do you feel, if you remember, when do you feel you really fell in love with Christ? Because I know when I fell in love with him and it was like, this very unusual moment where I was thinking, I'm actually in love with Jesus. And I didn't even know Jesus then. And I just like instantly loved him. And when I loved him, I fell in love with him. And it sounds weird to people who aren't in love with him. They think, what, are you crazy? But we're not crazy. I know my moment. So I'm just wondering if you remember or know that moment. I wouldn't say it's exactly a specific moment, but I would say, I would say it's a time in my life. So I was, a, I was in middle school, more or less. And I had a lot of this, I was going through a lot of the same struggles that your average middle schooler goes through. I don't think I was really special or different in that way. And and just not really knowing how to handle that, right? Not feeling really comfortable being able to explain these things to my classmates because sometimes to solve a problem, you need to ask someone who's smarter than you. And my classmates were probably about as equal as I was. So I don't think they really would have been able to help. And at the same time, even if, you know, just talking to them would have been helpful just to get it out there to like vent. I don't think I really felt close enough to any of them to really be able to talk about those things. So I didn't really have anyone my age to be able to talk to. And I really didn't have the confidence or trust to talk to my parents about some of the stuff just yet. So I, I kind of turned to the only thing I really knew that I could turn to, and that was my faith. It was a very like haphazard at the beginning, but still it was like, all right, occasionally I'm going to try and pray a decade of the rosary, or I'm going to just like pray and ask God, or I'm going to try and express this through like poetry. And it, it was difficult, but at the same time, like that was a lot of groundwork if it wasn't at that time in middle school, I would say when I first got on to the confirmation retreats. Remember the confirmation retreats, the two that I was participating in confirmation for, and then also the two that I was helping as a peer leader for were also very, very powerful. And just throughout that that whole period, I would say it's a very gradual, continual growth, just growing more and more in love, you know, with God, wanting to spend that time in the chapel, wanting to spend, you know, time in prayer, doing doing ministry, you know, being around other young Catholics. So just over time that took a deeper and deeper root into my heart and 
Uh, it's been, wow, each 10 years, uh, maybe a little bit more or less than that, but like, yeah, 10 years. Wow. And, you know, it's interesting you say that about the confirmation retreats because I get the impression, I've never been to one, but I get the impression that that happens a lot and frequently. I know like Father Matthew has talked about his experience was at a confirmation retreat. And I've heard that from a lot of people. And I've also heard even the kids that are reluctant to go maybe on the confirmation retreat the first day might be a little rough because they have you put down your devices and all these things. But I've heard that they really turn to the Lord in that moment. It really makes a big impression. Obviously, you had that happen. Can you give a sense when you go to those that you can see the kids that are falling in love with Jesus or changing their mindset? Can you kind of see it or do you think it's a lot more internal? I would say it depends. Uh, it's a, it requires experience. So you have to have gone on a lot of these retreats. You have to be able to be aware of kind of what's going on inter internally, but also what's going on in other people's uh, lives and faith walks, especially over that retreat. And then at some point you can kind of start to be able to discern. And something I've talked with, with Father Matthew and a couple of other people about, you can kind of observe where someone is at or coming from. It, it, once you get to a certain kind of level of spiritual maturity, and I say level because it's not that spiritually mature, but you can kind of pay attention. Okay, this person, they talk about this. This is how they talk about that. But there's also people I know that really, even as they were coming to fall in love with Jesus, they were still like suppressing a lot of that. So they didn't show it externally, but internally that was like one of one of my friends, he, he said uh, he would be that kid that really wanted to be there, but he wouldn't show it. He would sit in the back, he'd have his arms folded and his like hoodie up and like he would look down, but he would be really attently, like intently paying attention to whatever, whatever was being said on stage. Mm. And, and there's also those other kids that are just front row, they want to be there, they're volunteering to lecture, they're volunteering to alter serve because they do want to be there. So I would say there's like some, something you can kind of tell and some you can kind of, you know, not really tell. But at the end of the day, it's like, it's the Lord who judges and he's going to be able to tell like, who's going to respond to the call and who's not. So, and when. And when. Yeah. Yeah. And when. I agree with that. I just get very excited, like knowing that I converted and how I felt and how excited I was. I love this time of year when there's the people that are getting ready to go become Catholic at the Easter vigil. And I'm just so happy for them. It just brings tears of joy to my eyes and to my heart that they are experiencing, but they haven't even experienced the most beautiful part yet. I'm so excited for them. It's such a beautiful thing. And it is in God's timing. It is, you know, with his prompting. I know Simon and I have a friend who also we've done work for and he is in the RCIA group right now. And we're so happy for him. I never even thought that might be something he would be interested in. And now when I see him on Sunday and he just looks, I can just see it in his face, you know, and I'm just thinking, just wait. <laughs> it's like, this is great. Yeah. Just wait. Yeah. So I think it's exciting to see people going through that process. For sure. So what is the process when you decide you want to go in the seminary? What's the process of that? All right. So I would say we'll probably take a few steps backwards and say, okay, let's say you're discerning a, a call to the priesthood. Okay. Uh, first, you should talk to your pastor. So in our, in our parish, be like following, it's like the head priest. Uh, typically, it's the oldest priest, but talk to him first. And then we'll say the most established. How's that's that? probably, that's probably a more <laughs> prudent way of putting that. Yes. Um, or whoever has the title of pastor. It's, yeah. Yeah. And then he'll probably get you in touch with the vocations director for your regions, so the regional vocations director. And then talk to him. Then he'll be able to kind of get you in touch with what paperwork and all that. Um, but here in LA, if you're not, if you haven't graduated college yet, so if you're still in high school, you know, coming out of high school, um, if you haven't graduated college yet, then you would go to the Pre Queen of Angels Priestly Formation House program. So you would then attend college while living there at the Formation House, just still discerning, having a couple of other classes and retreats that, that go on there. And then once you graduate college, then you would go to St. John's in Camarillo. But if you have already graduated college, then you would just go to St. John's, obviously having talked to your pastor and your vocations director first, doing the whole application. Then you go to St. John's, you'll take two years of philosophy and then four years of theology. I think it's a year of living in the parish. I think it's like nine months, but like a year of being in the parish and then being ordained as a transitional deacon. Six months after that, being ordained as a priest and then you're, you're a priest, you know, you're ordained. But I'm not going to have to take those two years of philosophy because I'll have a bachelor's in philosophy graduating coming out of college. Okay. So there's kind of two tracks. You have the haven't graduated college and have graduated college. And it really just depends on 
kind of where you go for the first couple of years. And then when you end up going to the, the major seminary in Camarillo, St. John's, your classes will, will, will look a little different. So when you're there and you're saying, what did you call it? A formation? Formation class? house. Yeah. So is that safe to say that they're kind of keeping you away from like wild college life? They're trying to keep you kind of focused. Is that a good way to say it? A little bit. I don't know exactly how I'd characterize it in response to that per se. But oh, I, it is wild. I would this say what you're telling me it's it's a house of formation, and so we're there not to I think be preserved from the world, but I think in order to be conformed to Christ. Okay. Um, and and I would say that's more. I would put it that way because there are certain retreats that we'll go to uh, once a month, and we'll stay there at the formation house over the weekend, and go on that retreat that they'll put on for us, and it'll just be like the the ten of us because there's only ten of us that live there right now, and. Obviously, if you kind of do something that's a little too out of bounds, then you might get called into the formator's office and be like, let's have a conversation about that. You probably know what you should be doing. But I guess what I'm saying is it's better than if you were just living on your own in an apartment or with a bunch of frat boys. Yes. Okay. 100%. Yeah. So it's kind of like trying to keep you on the straight and narrow. But then if you mess up, you're human and you'll get. I don't want to say. Corrected. Corrected. uh, That's a nice word. Change. Corrected. So I like that. Okay. So when you go to your, what was it? Spiritual director? No, what did you call it? Vocations director. Vocations director. When you go and you say that you're interested in becoming a priest or however you worded it to them, are they welcoming to you and like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. Welcome. This is going to be great. Or are they trying to not discourage you, but be realistic about it at that point? Or, you know, because I would imagine over the it, the entire time you're trying to decide what you're going to do, there has to be the truth and the realization of things. Because I know a lot of people that have gone, you know, tried to go to the seminary. Some of them have made it and some of them don't. And I think you have to really decide what you're doing and, and be sure about it. Same with the RCIA. It's the same thing. You're not tied to it. You're not like shackled and they're saying, now you have to do it. Now you're locked in. It does have to be your choice, your decision. So how are you received when you go? So I would say it's actually neither of those. It's a little bit of both. I'd, I'd say probably that's a better way of putting it. Because, for example, if you reach out to the vocations director, they'd probably say, oh, that's awesome. We have a you know vocations event going on on this day at this time. You know, show up. We're happy to see you. They'll watch well, you probably before that. They'll probably reach out and say, let's call or let's chat. Let's talk. They just want to get to know you, right? Because the vocations director... Chances are they've seen a number of guys go into seminary. Some of them leave. Some of them not even enter seminary. So they kind of have a more or less a little bit of a grasp about who, who's kind of ready and who's not. So they want to get a good grasp of who you as an individual are. They'll kind of meet with you just to chat, see where you're at, see where your prayer is at, see what you like to talk about, kind of see how mature you are. And then they'll invite you to like a couple of events and you'll see some of the other guys that are also discerning to join. You'll meet some of the other priests. You might even meet the archbishop or a regional bishop and just kind of getting to, to know the other guys. And then that's at the same time, they'll kind of have conversations about if you're thinking you're ready to join this year or next year for seminary, and then they'll help you along with that process as well. I would say they're very like, warm and welcoming. Yes. So you've cracked jokes with them, but at the same time, we're talking about spiritual things. And it's it's awesome to see have that, have that relationship. Uh, I'd say that's probably what the foundation is, having that relationship first. And then from that relationship, being able to enjoy, but also to be able to maybe correct or encourage to, to change. Well, I think that's kind of honestly... When people are coming out of high school, going into university, I remember my dad, who was a teacher, he used to say a lot of kids would go out of high school into university and think they wanted to do a certain thing, completely change their major. I think that's very typical. And he would always say, just go get your basic stuff in the first two years. Like he encouraged junior college because he said, then when you decide, because you're going to probably change your mind. And so I think it's fair to say becoming a priest, it's not just a job. It's a lifestyle. It's a very serious, in a good way, but a very serious commitment. Exactly. And I also, just like everything Catholic, everything takes a long time. I think it's good that it takes a long time. I think it's such an incredibly important job. People's lives are in their hands, the priests, and I'm glad it takes a long time. I'm glad it takes a lot of discernment. I think there's a lot of priests that maybe aren't the best in in any job, but to be a seriously, you know, devoted priest, I think that's really interesting. So, so far in the school, 
how's it going? I shared earlier about how I, I inherited my mother's maybe smarts would probably be a better way to put it. And that's been that's been great because I haven't really had to study a lot throughout high school or even middle school. But the downside is I never really had to learn how to do the discipline of studying. So especially going to college, it's been a little bit of a, a struggle to like really sit down and like, all right, I'm gonna focus on my studies, right? I'm gonna focus on my studies. But I would say probably also a very average struggle for your average 21 year old in right. 2023. So I'm trying not to think too highly or too low of myself, but at the same time being realistic and trying to fix that problem. But I would say just that, that's in reference to specifically the school. I've also used it as an opportunity to actually evangelize as well. So there's a couple of people in a number of my classes where I've talked to them, maybe maybe very superficially or maybe at other times very in depth about the faith or just about what their beliefs are about God or about the world or about how things should be done. And that's been it's been a very fruitful opportunity. Uh, I recently had a, a person who reach out to me and want to pick my brain about certain topics and in a very like charitable, kind way. I didn't feel like I was being badgered or abused or accused in any way. And so I was like, all right, well, this is interesting. We'll, we'll see. We'll see kind of where this goes. And at the end of the class, because the class has ended and it's now it's, you know, moving on to, to spring classes, he said that he wanted to keep talking to me and we should get coffee sometime. And I was like, sure, why not? I was like, you have my phone number. If you want to reach out, feel free to. I'm not going to say no. And I was, I was intrigued, I'm like inter- interested to see where this is going to go. So it's given a number of opportunities for evangelization as well. Oh, good. That's great. I know your brother has said he he does that at his school as well. He's open to talk to people. I love that about him. And I thought he also had some pretty good ideas for a teenager, you know, about the social media and about devices and things. I thought he had some pretty good ideas about that because it's a very distracting world. And Satan certainly doesn't want you to be a priest. And that's the thing is distraction, you know, of our prayer life and everything. Do you have any priestly role models? Oh, Steve Daffer. Yeah. And um, Monsignor Sal. He's the pastor of a church in Gardena. I don't remember what the name of it is, but it's it, it's, a, it's a church in Gardena. And he did one of my interviews. And I actually recently had, uh, had dinner with him as part of a vocations event a couple weeks ago. Just very pastoral. I haven't really talked to him too much, but just like from what I remember talking to him about and just like the feeling I got being in his presence was like, all right, this is this is a guy I can really trust. This is a priest that I can really look up to. And what about what about him makes you say that? Well, like when you say pastoral, what what does that mean? No, it's like um, like Father Leon does this also pretty well. He is it's someone you can be in the presence of, be comfortable with, uh, feel relaxed and feel welcomed. While at the same time, knowing that if you say something that maybe is a little out of line that he maybe won't like come down really harshly on you, but he's probably going to be like, all right, he might, might give you a look because you'll probably know you probably shouldn't have said that. Um, and he'll still be willing and able to like give you advice that would actually be applicable to your situation while at the same time not judging you or being overly harsh. Mm-hmm. And that balance is basically everywhere in, in our faith. And that's something I've realized more or more recently is there's, there's always two extremes and, and there's always like that middle line we're supposed to walk. And that middle line is sometimes very, very difficult to do of willing to to correct someone, but at the same time, being very warm and welcoming to anyone and everyone. Right. So. That's good. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm very interested in people's role models and what draws them to people, you know. So that's interesting. What is the hardest part about where you are at now in the process. I mean, you said you said the distractions, but the distractions. Else? Yes, I'd also say like the discipline, the discipline of making sure you're getting everything done, not just the schoolwork, but also prayer. Making sure you're exercising, getting enough sleep. Like just last week, there was the um, Our Lady Guadalupe, and so I was serving at the at the cathedral that Monday night. So it was midnight. I was serving at the cathedral, and I had classes the next day. This was finals week. So I was very like a little stressed out about, okay, how am I going to get enough sleep? And I got probably three or four hours of sleep that night. The next night we're going to be out, out late again. And I was like, all right, this is, this is a little stressful because I'm not going to have a lot of sleep. So you have to juggle not only being active in, in the church, but also being active at school, also getting enough sleep and still working out and also getting all your prayer in. So there's just a lot to balance and juggle. And the distractions obviously don't help with that. Well, I feel Sorry. like that's really prepping you for the priesthood because... Those men really have to juggle going to the hospital, doing saying mass, doing confessions. You know, there's there's so many things that they're constantly like. Sometimes Father 
Leon really overbooks himself. He had a weekend a month or two ago where I was thinking, Father, what are you doing? You're, you're overbooking yourself. Because they were things that he scheduled in addition to the things that are not scheduled, you know, so he pulled it off. But, you know, I, I think that is prepping you for that. I would also add that uh, this past Friday I had a luncheon. There was an archbishop's luncheon with the seminarians and the bishops. So most of the regional bishops were there. Bishop Swavik. I don't even know how to pronounce his first name. For- forgive me, Bishop, if you're listening. So we were having you know lunch with him and a couple of the guys from the Santa Barbara region. And one of the things, I forget exactly how the question came up, but it's like, how do you handle, how do you handle the balance? Like, wh- where's most of your time spent as a bishop? He's like, well, most of it's spent driving because he has to drive from one end of even just his small diocese as a subdiocese of the archdiocese. But he's like, you, you really have to like be prudent in what you book yourself for because people will give you so many invitations. And if you want to say yes to all of them, that's great. People will be able to get to see you. You get to know them. They'll, they'll come to like you a little bit more, look at to know you. But at the same time, you're going to be spending all of that time and you're going to get really tired. So yeah. you kind of have to have that balance. I was like, that's a really good point, especially yeah. coming from a bishop too. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's interesting. And what so far is your favorite part? favorite part. I would say it's community uh, by far, by far, because while yes, it does have its struggles, those struggles also give you an opportunity to to kind of change and also grow in humility, right? Like you say, maybe not intelligent comment in front of everyone and they all kind of just like shake their heads and like kind of maybe roll their eyes at you. It's like, okay, well, you probably shouldn't have said that. Maybe one of them, they're going to come talk to you and tell you, hey, that kind of made me feel uncomfortable. But at the same time, that's an opportunity to grow in humility. As for just the pure joys of it, I would say that there's just 10 guys, yes, but there's so many diverse interests in, in among among those 10 guys. So one guy likes Elvis a lot. He will listen to Elvis music on his record player very loudly and everyone in the hallway will be able to hear it. But it's great because you can always talk to the guy about music or about Elvis. Yeah, now the other guys like sports. So you can always talk to them about sports, about basketball, football, soccer, and then other guys like movies. So you can always talk to those guys about you know whatever the, the new movie that came out is and hey, do you want to go see that movie together? And then you also have another guy who likes Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings, and um, but he likes video games, Star Wars. And so he, you can talk to him about video games and such. And then one of the guys, I, I like talking to him a lot. He's always talking about like the faith. So he'll, he'll talk about movies. Yeah, he'll talk about music. He'll crack jokes with the guys. He'll you know, maybe talk about sports a little bit. But at the same time, like you want to talk about the faith for hours on end, he's your guy to go to. Yeah. Um, so just that, that diversity of interests and being able to like have those different conversations with different and again, you're you're in a group in school, but you're able to be talking about God. And in our world, like I, I always get so excited when I'm at work and, and we can be talking about God. I remember like my office and Gabriel Rivera's office are in the same floor. And there were times where we would be in the hallway and, and we would just be praying. And I would say, I, I don't think a lot of workplaces this happens, you know, and it's just, it's so nice. That's one of the things, you know, like being around people with common interests, especially when it's the Lord. It's it's so nice. I know I you know, I love to talk to my husband Simon about he's the only one I feel wants to hear me talking about God all the time. Maybe that's not true, but that's how I feel. And it's nice because I mean my family doesn't want to talk about God with me. And so I love that I feel like I can just talk about God and feel good about it. And I just feel our world is just so negative about when you have faith and when you have God in your life and they're so against it and it's just doesn't feel good, you know? They all want to talk about whatever they want to talk about. So it must feel kind of nice to be in a group where you are feel free to talk about God and your feelings and you don't get made fun of about it. Yeah, it is It is really nice. And, and in a way that I'm not trying to, to downplay or overplay, I'm trying to hit exactly as it is. It's hard to have those conversations with everyone, especially at the Formation House, because not everyone is really open to that in, in a sense that if you're not really good friends with someone, uh, then maybe they're not talk, they're not really talking to you about very vulnerable things. Mm-hmm. And so if you don't really know them that well, they're not really willing to talk about the faith at length or maybe uh, in certain aspects of it because they don't know you that well. And maybe, maybe that's their own flaw. Maybe that's just you haven't put enough effort in. But it's it doesn't, it doesn't happen all the time. But at the same time, if you want to have those conversations, you can't have them. It just you have to know who you want to talk to with them or... Uh, who about those topics with, um, but also when, and also like what you can talk about. It's just, it takes prudence. When you want to become a priest, are there different orders? And how, how does that go? So you have different orders. So you have like the Benedictines, you have the Franciscans, you have Norbertines, you have 
There's a couple of others. This is a test. The Jesuits. And then there's offshoots from all of them. You have the Sisters of Charity. So the long, long short of it is Sisters of Charity are not priests. They're, they're nuns. But so occasionally throughout the church's history, you've had different people that either themselves or just kind of them with a couple of other people have decided to start a group of priests or brothers or nuns that focused on a specific group of people uh, to minister to them or a specific, um, maybe not virtue, but like way of living. And not that those are exclusive to that group, but that they want to focus on them more. So you have, for example, St. Benedict. He wanted to go live in the desert with a couple of other brothers and basically focus on prayer, asceticism, working and praying. So aura et labora, praying and working. And so the Benedictine order is still around today and they have certain things that they focus on. You also have the Franciscans, which are basically the exact opposite of the Benedictines. So they are working in like specifically in cities and in communities so that they can work with the poorest of the poor in that community. And so they, they won't work like the Benedictines, but they will minister to, the, to that group of people. Now you'll have a Franciscan priest and you'll have a Benedictine priest and they'll both be valid priests in the Catholic church. But their orders will look, will look different. Their communities will look different. So in, in the Catholic Church, you do have different like groups and, and different, different priests, but they're all still Catholic. They all still celebrate the same Mass, the same sacraments. Um, they're just, their prayer might look a little different, or their r- practice of community or virtue might look a little different. But at the end of the day, like they're all still part of the Catholic Church. Uh, so if you want to be a, a diocesan priest, so that's your average everyday priest, then you would go to a diocesan seminary, which is your average seminary. But if it's a Carmelite seminary or a Benedictine seminary, then they'll clarify as Benedictine or as you know Jesuit or, or Franciscan. But your average priest is like a diocesan. So at what point do you kind of decide that? Like, do you need to know that now? Or is that something as you go along, you can kind of decide where, what path you're going to take or what path God is going to lead you to? So it's not something you have to decide at the outset. And I say that, I'm going to clarify that statement very heavily here in a second, but let's say you feel a calling to the, to the priesthood or, or to celibacy, put it that way. Because I, I know people that have felt a calling to celibacy and then they go to a seminary and they don't feel at home. They're like, wait a second, but I thought I thought I was called to the priesthood because I felt a call to celibacy. It's like, well, just because you feel a call to celibacy does not mean that you're called to the priesthood. So then they go to, say, a Benedictine monastery or um, they go to serve with the Franciscans or the Jesuits and then they feel at home. Did, did something go wrong? No, they, they felt a call to the celibacy aspect, which is those communities have that those aspects, the celibacy, um, the community, the the prayer, but they don't have that priesthood aspect where they are celebrating the sacraments or hearing confessions. For let's say, take me for example. I'm going through three or four years down the road, and I decide mm, I want to go to discern with the Benedictines. Then I would leave formation here, and I would go discern with the Benedictines. But I wouldn't be able to. I guess it might be more difficult to get ordained and then become a Benedictine. Uh, that just might be a whole more difficult, complex process. I don't know exactly how that would look, what that would look like or how, how that would work, but over, over time, you're able to come or to leave formation. I haven't made vows yet, so I don't have to, to stay in formation until I become a priest. So if I wanted to discern out and go discern elsewhere, I, I would be free to do that. So speaking of that you haven't taken your vows yet, are you at this stage allowed to have a girlfriend? So no, because, and I'll give you an analogy. If, if you have, take your average 21-year-old guy and he goes to Mass and sees this really pretty you know, lady who's also going to Mass and she's very holy, and he's like, I want to spend some more time with her and discern maybe marriage with this woman, then it would be uh, imprudent for him to also have three other women that he's also discerning marriage with at the same time. It's like you take one relationship at a time and you discern that in or out. And so in seminary, it's, it's, I would say it's very similar, if not the exact same, because you're not going to discern two relationships, three relationships at the same time. You want to discern, okay, is God calling me to be a priest? Yes or no? If it's a no, then I'll go discern maybe marriage or maybe um, going to discern to become a brother. But if God's not, if God is calling me to the priesthood, then obviously I'm going to go there. So it would just, especially with the balance, like that's that's more like the theological aspect. I would say just the prudential aspect. I don't think I have the time for that. Right. Well, and we've talked about about that in the priesthood episode and also I believe in the misconceptions episode with Deacon Don. The general consensus was, like you're saying, your life would be divided and you wouldn't be able to give time to your wife and family because, again, the priests are very busy. It is their life. It is their family. I mean, I can see it perfectly clear. It was just a question because I think maybe some people might wonder. 
And I do know that that's come up where we had a seminarian that is now engaged. And, you know, we're happy for him, but I'm glad he figured that out. And I know I asked your brother if he was interested in becoming a priest, but he's interested in having a family. So, and he said, you know, you never know it might change, but that's what he's thinking now. I mean, I'm going to put you a little bit in the hot seat right now. You're a very good looking guy for people who aren't seeing him out there in the world. He's very handsome, as is your brother. But is that something where you're not quite sure yet? Or you feel at this point, you feel pretty sure that you'd rather devote your life to to the Lord? So not that I don't like the way that question was asked, but just like... You can readjust it. I I don't know how else to ask it. It's, I would say at this point in time, at this point in my life, I've seen that the only door that the Lord has opened for me has been to the priesthood. Okay. And while, yes, I have met a couple of other young, uh, attractive Catholic women who I'm like, I can totally see myself marrying this woman or you know, having a bunch of kids and all, all, the, all the things, uh, living until we're 80 years old, you know, being that old, you know, married couple that's been married forever. But at the same time, there's always part of that when I'm imagining that, when I'm like maybe daydreaming in a way that might be taking up too much time, I should be studying instead. But there's part of my heart that says, no, like that's not, that's not everything the Lord has in store for you. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's part of me that's like, no, that's just as happy on maybe on the outside. I think that there'd be an aspect of joy, like a deeper joy that would really be missing. And it's not because she's not attractive or she's not Catholic. It's not because I'm broken or, or probably because I'm sinful, but also because the Lord has a different calling for me. Mm-hmm. And just that, that verbiage is sometimes difficult to really pin down Yeah, because I'm not going to go tell my brother, like, uh, like you shouldn't be, you know, go get married because ultimately marriage is un- unfulfilling. It's like, no, if he's called to marriage, he's called right. to marriage. I'm called to priesthood. I'm called to priesthood. Right. And the Lord will, the Lord will make us happy. The Lord will satisfy us. Right. I agree. That's what he does. Yeah, I agree with that. So, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry. I, I feel like that was a... No, it's, it's okay. But... I, I was trying to be very respectful. Oh, you did. So I don't want to ask you any questions where I feel like I'm challenging that you want to be a priest because I'm all for it. And I do have an apology for you that maybe you don't remember, but I do. And I think about it all the time now, and I'm so sorry. So I'm making a public apology. So again, I'm a wedding coordinator, and I'm naturally a, what's it called? A matchmaker. 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 I have this in my head all the time. My poor music director, I'm I'm on him right now. I have somebody I'm really wanting him to. Um, sorry, Andrew. But I I really have this girl that I'm interested in for him. But I remember I literally came up to you and said, oh, my wedding coordinator assistant, she's so cute. And you, you guys, and you said, I want to be a priest. And I was like, oh. And I told Andrew, my music director, I said that. And he goes, Lori, you shouldn't have said that. And I said, well, I didn't know. And I just thought you'd be a beautiful couple. So I apologize for that. <laughs> well, I mean, it's maybe I'll have Henry look at her. <laughs> he was, he's looking for a wife at Franciscan, just, just okay. as a heads up. Okay. Um, but I mean, I would also just say that like, I, I have, I'm aware. Yes. I am. I'm a good looking guy. I am. Yes. Aware that I'm not, you know, uh, that I do have a, a little bit of smarts. I am aware that I you know do take the faith quite seriously. And for some people that is going to be a lot of boxes checked. But at the same time, it's like, all right, yeah, I go back to where is the Lord calling me? I've had a number of opportunities where it's like, this is a woman that I, I not only want to, but have the freedom to do that. But it's just, no, the Lord's calling me to something else. And there's obviously been a lot of work that I've had to put into that, right? There's obviously over the past couple of years, like I, I've been in the formation house for about six months now, not four years. So the time between high school, graduating high school in 2020 and now has been a lot of formation, a lot of, well, I'm discerning the priesthood because of this reason. No, oh, no, actually, that's not why I'm discerning the priesthood. I'm discerning the priesthood because of this reason. And then kind of having to sort and sift through all those different wounds, all that brokenness, all that, you know, past junk baggage that I've had to be like, how do I, how do I figure out this calling, this potential calling in the midst, in the face of all of this brokenness of right. my past? Um, so it hasn't been easy, but at the same time, like the Lord still gives us the light in the darkness. Can you clarify a little bit more about your baggage and your brokenness? Because I think a lot of people in the world have those things. That's not specific to you, but but what do you mean by that? Yeah. So I mentioned in middle school, I had obviously some very middle school struggles. Part of that was was just not really knowing how to handle my emotions. Uh, very had had a temper as a child, and that kind of caused some some problems. I, I would say it's uncommon for people to have 
excellent role models of what a man should be or what a woman should be and and how those relationships maybe especially in the schoolyard should go and so going into high school not obviously not being very you know mature because i'm a freshman in high school but also having not having like the the best of role models not that my parents were in any way bad but just uh they weren't perfect right and so not having those perfect role models being immature not really knowing how to handle my emotions just caused a whole avalanche of problems in in high school and i would say that was probably about average more or less like roughly i was about average with the things i was struggling with but at the same time like once i graduated high school some of those things cleared up a little bit uh, i was you know now working construction for two years with other guys and they're obviously machismo guys so you've got they've got their own problems they're not exactly being the most beneficial but i was able to grow up a little bit and at the same time i'm still discerning that right so at the, at the same time that i'm working i'm working with these guys that are kind of machismo i have a lot more of my freedom i'm driving myself to work every morning i'm earning my own money but at the same time i still have these past wounds these past maybe relationships friendships as well these past wounds that just kind of come up in anyone's life to just give a random example let's say you have a father who is maybe a little too encouraging right not in a way that's creepy at all but a little too encouraging and so now you have this expectation that you know men in your life should be really encouraging when they don't give you that you think oh they're they're doing something like i'm doing something wrong Right? Mm-hmm. Now, it's not because your dad's imperfect, right? Maybe that was a, a little bit of a personality defect, but it's not because he's a terrible sinner. And it's not because these other men in your life are just horrendous people that they're not encouraging you. It's just that's kind of sometimes how the cards are laid. That's kind of how things happen. And so now you have to figure out your vocation, maybe like different relationships, maybe with a significant other or maybe with you know your your, your brothers in the context of this wound that kind of just has has been given to you. And so you have to sort through all of that. And I would say that there's a number of things that I can point to in my own life where it's like I had something similar like that happen. And now I have to figure out, okay, it, does God want me to be a priest because God wants me to be a priest? Or do I want to be a priest because I'm really just afraid of getting married? Mm. Right. And and then I have to like figure that out. Okay, well, why actually do I want this? Mm. Does it mean he wants this? Is it God who wants this? Do it, does God want this for me? And I also want this. Or does God want something else for me? And I want something else. And it just takes time. It takes time. And that's something that can even be done in the seminary. It's, it's part of formation, but in my, my my own personal life, I just wasn't ready to take that step yet. I was still too afraid. I was like, I, I do not feel comfortable enough to really take that step. But yeah, that whole story of the past couple of years might be the, the enough enough content just for a whole other episode. Mm. So yeah, I think that's kind of the, a similar thing when people are deciding to get married, and we help them in the marriage prep program and everything, because you have to figure out why do you want to get married, and it it is lifelong. It's not like a secular, you know, just civil marriage. So you have to really figure out why you want to get married. It's not about the wedding. The wedding's great, by the way. I do a good wedding, but it's about the marriage, you know. So yeah, that that makes sense. Right. And also he molds us. You know, I love that analogy of like him molding us. And I always feel like things are being chipped away, the dirty stuff that needs to be broken off so that you can get down to the really good quality love and and deep commitment whether you're a priest or not you know to have that commitment to give up worldly things and worldly feelings so you know i'm all for that i support you in it and i and I, I i won't match make anymore all right <laughs> and you know Thank i love you. i love the story about father matthew when he went to a retreat i believe is what he said or some sort of thing like that and he had a girlfriend and they were sitting there and she could tell like they both started crying because in happy tears, but she really knew that he had this calling and he felt it and she supported that. I love that story because he's also a very up and coming, very handsome, uh, smart guy. And so, you know, I just I just think that's an interesting factor, not to say anything about. I mean, I know you're not saying it in a prideful, boasting way. I think it's just like, you know, it's just a good question. So anyway, thank you for oh, answering. Wow, that. Thank you. Thank you. OK. So what advice would you give to someone who is also interested in pursuing the priesthood? Like, what would you say? Very good question. Very good question. So three things. One, you got to have that prayer life. Uh, if you don't have a solid prayer life or a consistent prayer life and you're not focusing on that, it's going to be a lot more difficult for you to be able to hear God's voice because you're not practicing that every single day. You're not practicing sitting down and trying to hear God's voice or trying to grow in your relationship with God. So step one, have a strong prayer life. Step two is don't discern alone. Our vocations are not just for us to kind of figure out by ourselves and 
everyone else to kind of just figure out when we tell them it's we're supposed to be in, in community. And so, like I said before, once you've kind of decided, okay, I want to discern this more fully, uh, you have to at some point tell your pastor. Pastor will get you in touch with your regional vocations director, and then you'll kind of, he'll kind of help you with the rest, the, the next steps. And then the, the third piece of advice I would say is having that patience and peace. If there's any fear or concern or worry, and if it's stronger than those, if it's like anxiety and you're having anxiety about this, that is not from God, right? Like there's a figure of the Lord, but there's also just a worldly fear. And if you feel that worldly fear in your, in your soul, in your heart, you're living that out, like pray for that peace. If you're worried about like, if I don't get in the seminary this year, I'm not going to have anything thing to do. And then it's going to be terrible. And my life's going to, it's like, all right, take a deep breath, relax, going to be okay. God's going to take care of you. In any other relationship, let's say a man is wanting to get married to this woman and he's really anxious about like, not just getting things wrong, but like, if I don't marry her tomorrow, then things are going to be terrible 10 years down the road. It's like, all right, you need to calm down and it's going to be okay. So yeah, just to recap, having that strong prayer life, but also you know, reach out to your, your vocation director, your pastor, your pastor first, because if you reach out to the vocation director first, your pastor might feel like you're going over his head and it's not a good idea. And also just a second note on that real quick. If your parents maybe aren't like really comfortable with that idea or you're not comfortable bringing that, bringing that topic up with them just yet, like that's okay. I was very blessed to have my parents be very supportive of that. And there's a number of people that I know that, that their parents were not very supportive or they were really supportive to the point where it's almost like pushy. And so uh, maybe at the outset, don't be so worried about that. You can, you can talk to your pastor and your vacations director, but at some point your pastor is going to introduce you to the parish as someone who's discerning the priesthood. You probably don't want that to be the first time your parents are finding out that you're not starting to waste it. Right. So, and then, yeah, the last point is just have that peace, have that patience, um, just have that trust that God's going to take care of you. If you don't have that, it's like, all right, ask God to give that to you because you shouldn't be anxious about this. This shouldn't be something you're losing sleep over. So. Right. I love that. You know, again, you're going to end up being a role model. I think you already are. And well, I do. And I also know you're very well thought of in, in the church. I know Father Leon really is supporting you. I've really witnessed Father Leon being very supportive of you. And I think he is excited. If Father Leon gets excited, I think he's excited about you discerning the priesthood. So anyway, I really thank you for coming today. I really hope that this will reach out to many people's ears that are considering this or know people that would introduce this episode to them so that they can hear out of your mouth what your path has been. Because people can talk all day long about stuff, but when somebody is going through something themselves, I think that really helps other people. Because if somebody's just talking to them and saying, oh, I want my son to be a priest, or it's hearing it out of your mouth. And this is a process. I mean, this is going to be a long process. I'd love to have you back every now and then to see how it's going. I think that, what do you think about that? I think that would be great. I think that'd be great. We'd have to work on the scheduling, but right. I, should have, I should have the time and I'd be willing to as well. Because it is going to be a long process. I, I do think that that would be important to see like how you're doing and where you're at and your mindset and all that. So I do really appreciate you coming. I support you. I'm so excited for you. And anyway, was there anything, any last thoughts that you can think of that I didn't ask you? you pray, pray the rosary if you can. If you're not Catholic, it's going to be okay. Just keep searching for the truth. Hopefully God will, God will find you or the truth will find you. That's awesome. Well, thanks again. And thank you. Love you. Bye. Thank you for joining me today. Now go out and be a bright light in someone's life. And remember, be focused, be faithful, and be fresh. Fresh Catholic is produced, edited, and recorded at Wonder Mouse Studios in Ventura, California.